So I'm talking to Unique Burns and Marion today. As Elizabeth said, my name is Justin. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, feel free to just raise your hand or speak out. Uh, either way, it doesn't matter, just uh, as we go. Uh, if, if my volume isn't loud enough, uh, just say something to me, uh, nudge me along, say, can you speak up? So uh, I'll try to do that. The mask obviously uh, muffles uh, volume. So I'll try to, to keep that going for the next hour. Anyway, a uh, little bit of background about me. First off, I am not a scientist. <laughs> I'll make that explicit. <laughs> so I don't know uh, everything and anything. Uh, but I, um, hopefully I'm able to uh, bring some knowledge today about birds here in Marion. As Elizabeth said, I'm uh, president of the National Kentucky Bird Club. The club has actually just been around since 2006, a fairly new bird club here in Massachusetts. Um, and I have been the president since 2011. Uh, just a quick thing, we do two outings a month. Uh, in general, they're fairly close. We do them between New Bedford and Wareham. A lot of times they're between Marion, Rochester, and Manapoisett, and Fairhaven are the majority of them. We also meet once a month uh, over at the Manapoisett Library, and all our uh, outings and meetings are free and open to everyone. So a little short history of how I got into birding. Uh, I think how people get into birds and birding is really, really interesting. There seems to always be a, almost a spark moment or a history as a child for, for many people that are super interested in birds. So I just wanted to share a little bit about my history so you understand where I come from. And um, So anyway, as a child, uh, I always had an interest in animals. I used to love penguins. Uh, I was obsessed with them. If you have kids or grandkids, maybe they have the same obsession. And lots of people that love penguins and other animals and birds. Anyway, besides penguin, which is a bird, I never really had a lot of interest in other birds that you might see in the backyard or down a trail or whatnot. My dad, however, used to put out bird feeders. And there was just that casual interest of seeing cardinals and goldfinches and other birds that come to your feeder, along with this bird, a nuthatch. Or as my dad used to call it an upside down bird. <laughs> so its ability to go down the tree instead of up the tree like many other birds, right? Uh, and that stuck with me uh, this many years later. In my college years, I read a book titled The Late Great Lakes in Environmental History by William Ashworth. And although I always feel like I'm, I've been an environmentally conscious person, as a child I used to pick up trash uh, when I would see it, and uh, I never really had a fully understanding until I read this book about how much destruction humans can do to the earth and what it does to birds and animals and all, as well as humans. But this book also taught me on the flip side how much humans can do in a way of healing and protecting. You know, how much good can be done to the earth. And that's why you'll see when I talk about each species, I also talk about conservation efforts. But it wasn't really until I uh, moved to Chicago in my late 20s, I was living there, and for some reason I, I decided to go on this spring uh, bird walk that was led by a local Audubon chapter at a park there. And it was May, it was spring migration, which at the time I didn't know was a thing, kind of strange. But I went on this walk, and there were birds everywhere all different sizes, all different colors that I did not know existed in the United States. There were warblers dripping from the trees, which I didn't know were a thing. And I have been hooked ever since from that moment in time. It was really a spark moment for me. <clears throat> this is now many, many years later. This is my daughter from a couple years ago. And uh, I just love being able to share my love of birds, nature, the earth with my family. I'll be able to point that out to anybody anytime. Alright, so for many of you, you call Marion home. There are many reasons people choose to live here in Marion. Uh, I'm going to call out to you guys, what are some of the reasons that you either call Marion home or maybe this area? Anybody want to shout out? It's, 
It's not overdeveloped. Okay, that's good. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Quiet. It's quiet. Yeah. It's excellent. I have the harbor. I love that. Anybody else? Proximity to nature very easily. All kinds of nature. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome reasons. Yeah, I was, those are exactly what I was thinking when I asked that question. Some other things I often think of of when we have a place of home are, of course, family. Uh, we kind of mentioned it's uh, safe, uh, of course, community, and for many of us, uh, we either work around here or work close to here, right? So, clearly, some of these reasons that we've mentioned uh, aren't necessarily the same as birds, right? Um, uh, I, I work around here, but a bird doesn't necessarily have the same kind of thing. But we find it safe here, and so do birds. Um, one, one, one reason that was mentioned, uh, the harbor, I love to think about that. I think especially for people that live in this area, water is especially important. And that's why we call it home, right? We use it for recreation, we use it traveling on a boat, maybe for food if you go fishing or cohogging. We can, and of course, we can appreciate its beauty. So, before we get into the birds, I just want to talk a little bit about habitat. So, habitat is kind of defined by the place or environment where a plant or animal naturally or normally lives and grows. It's a really kind of a dense definition, but it's really, really important to understand habitat. This habitat is really important to birds, and as you'll see, there's kind of a common theme as we go along with the birds and their end. So, birds need a certain components to survive in habitat. They need food, water, cover, which is just safety, and they need space. We've already mentioned that today, right? So, food and water are important, and they're obviously kind of obvious why they're important, right? We need them to survive, either humans, birds, animals, it doesn't matter. But different birds require different food, right? So not all birds eat seed. Many of us have bird feeders in our backyards, and the birds go there and they eat seed. But many other birds don't want anything to do with seed. They're not made to eat seed, and they don't need, to eat, need or ever will eat seed. But they will eat some other foods like fruit, insects. Lots of insect uh, birds will be start coming in as insects come in the spring, right? And of course, fish. Space is incredibly important. Birds need adequate space to be able to nest, find food, and be safe. And all birds do not require the same amount of space. Something like a bobolink, which is a little bird that comes from uh, comes up here from southern uh, South America. It nests uh, like in farmlands and grasslands. It needs like five to ten acres of habitat. That's a lot of space, right? But on the other hand, you think about American Robin, which we see everywhere here, almost all year round. We only need a little space. Between my neighbor and my, uh, myself, which we have little small little properties, <coughs> we have three to four different pairs of robins just nesting in our yard. And they can adapt really well, right? They were even nesting on a lamp, uh, a little outside lamp porch light on my, on, at my house. So they're really adaptable. And, and you know, as things change, they're able to, to adapt, and that's why they sometimes are so common. So, plus space is a huge tug of war game between nature and humans. Practically speaking, humans need houses, right? A place to feel safe. And we have to build those, and those, that takes up lots of space. Also, places to eat and shop and work. We need all the th those things to kind of live our daily lives. In addition, uh, fun also comes into conflict with habitat. All we have to do is look at protection of piping pluggers to, to, on the beaches to see conflict between humans and birds. Other spaces, such as marshes, which Marion has a lot of, right, have seemed unimportantly globally, and many of them over time have been filled in, destroyed, or adapted to fit the needs of humans. And we're just beginning to learn why marshes aren't just important to birds, and, but as humans as well. Marshes have a great resilience to storms and hurricanes. 
And lastly, the, the last thing I mentioned was cover. Cover comes in many types. It could be bushes, trees, it could be even marshes. If a bird doesn't feel safe, it's not going to be there. So our first bird, the rosy term. Who in this room has heard of a, a, a term, or, or in particular, this rosy term before? Yeah, most of you. No surprise. So if you're looking out at a place like Silver Shell or Planting Island, or on a boat somewhere here in Marion or Massachusetts, you're likely to come across a common term, or a least term. Both are common enough to find along the coast from May through at least August here in the state. That isn't the case for this bird. And although I picked 10 birds to highlight today for everyone, if I was going to just pick one bird that was unique and rare to Marion, this would be the bird. Now, for those of you who've never heard of a tern, or the rosy tern, or you don't know the difference between a gall and a tern, which would be incredibly confusing, I'm just going to share a couple of little uh, identification tips. So, in general, terns are smaller and galls are bigger. Uh, terns have pointy wings and galls have kind of a broader, a broader wing. Uh, galls have kind of a, a rounded, bigger, larger beak where terns have really good pointed uh, beak. And of course, what is this used for? It's one of the other main differences that I, that helps me identify really quickly in the summertime when galls and terns are kind of everywhere, is a tern is going to go right down in the water, into the water, get it, grab a fish and come out. Where a gull is not going to do, necessarily do that. They're going to generally swoop down and then try to grab something. Uh, rosy tern, a little different from common and least tern. The main ID uh, identification are this black bill and black head. Although, uh, as the summer goes on, the bill will turn a little bit reddish. And compared to a common tern, which has an orange bill, and a least tern, which, although is smaller, hence its name, right, it has a bright yellow bill, and it also has this kind of white forehead here, which is a dead giveaway when looking at them. Uh, as the summer also goes along, these three types of tern species get really, really confusing. But we're not going to really get into that day. Today, it gets a little uh, crazy trying to identify uh, young birds. So, for those of you that uh, don't know about the rosy tern and what makes it so unique and rare, is that it's actually a federally endangered bird. Numbers from the organization Partners in Flight estimate the global population around 160,000. Not too bad. Uh, but only 6,400 actually breeding pairs are in the state of Massachusetts, uh, um, in, in the United States, excuse me. And a bird that was once numerous back in the 1800s uh, declined originally from the, the plume trade in the 1800s. And then again later on in the 1930s, uh, during ne at nesting sites, uh, galls kind of took over a lot of the, the terns' nesting sites and their population declined again. In 2013, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers regarded Bird Island, right here in Marion, as the most important island for rosy terns in Buzzards Bay. It's also the second largest uh, nesting colony in North America. Pretty crazy and uh, cool to think about right here in Marion. So without Bird Island as a critical site for roseate terns, the effects can be devastating for the bird. Think about uh, an oil spill, which happened about 20 years ago uh, out in Buzzard Bay, uh, or uh, rising sea levels uh, out, uh, out at uh, Bird Island. Uh, also, the main, uh, the main source of food for the tern is sand lance. It's a fish, along with herring and other fish. Um, I point that out because um, it's kind of a specialist with sand lance, and if, if that species of fish kind of disappeared or went declined, we would probably see the same kind of natural decline uh, with the tern. And interesting enough, even though the rosy tern does not have a good relationship with herring gull and other large gulls, 
It does have a kind of a symbiotic relationship with uh, common terms. Uh, it will often nest with uh, common terms, and because common terms are larger and they protect their nesting area better, the rosette term kind of relies on them to be able to protect their nesting area. adjust its habitat if it's compromised or eliminated. So that basically means that there are no more salt marshes, there are no more salt marsh sparrows. Like much of Marion, this bird is so much a part of salt marshes, it's what defines this bird, for better or worse. And um, I happened to look up this bird's kind of uh, special concern rating. It was actually given a 19 out of 20 20 being the worst out of uh, concern for the, this bird from partners in flight. So that's actually worse uh, than the rosia term, which is just kind of uh, crazy to think about. So this sparrow looks like a lot of other sparrows. Uh, it's small and it's brown. Uh, a good way to distinguish it from other sparrows, go to a small salt marsh. You might be able to pick it out from others. They're not, I'm sorry, it's work. <laughs> Uh, but if you have any, uh, if you go away from the salt marsh, you, you, you can just automatically say, oh, this bird is not going to be there. So that, that's one way. Just find its habitat and you'll be able to, more likely, be able to see it. But also, this bird has a super, super short tail. It almost looks like it's been cut off. This is a really great photo that sees that, uh, that shows that, excuse me. Um, it also has a straight orangey tin eyebrow right here. It's really uh, visual and you can see it right in the field. So definitely um, those are kind of the two identifications that you can see from the different uh, other sparrows. These sparrows do nest in the salt marshes themselves, having a nest placed just above the normal like high tide mark. You can only imagine with regular tides and storms and other sea level rise how difficult it might be have a successful nest. And I came across that one study suggested that the sparrow has the most success by laying eggs right after a new moon. And it does this, and I have no idea if it knows how to do this or if it's just by chance, but basically it gives the bird the most amount of time before the next high tide, extreme um, high tide for the moons. So not only is the salt marsh sparrow affected by tides and sea level rise, but also predation and activities that would lead to the destruction of salt marshes. And I wanted to share kind of what this bird looks like. So I, I have not actually, this is like the one bird out of the ten that we're going over today, I have not actually seen in Mary myself, but other people have. So they've seen it down here at the Catanza Club. And they've seen it down here on the Converse. And this little dot in the notch tabor just represents Marion in general. But so not too many sightings, but uh, they must be around here. But I also wanted to share a quick uh, I wanted to show this bird a little in the field. Mm-hmm. 
Long-tailed ducks are a winter visit visitor here at Marion. Um, trying to think if they're still around. Um, they might still be around a little bit, but generally they're they're on the move already. Uh, but generally, so this is a winter species that we have come here. Uh, they actually breed up in the Arctic and then winter here, which uh, for us humans. When we uh, like to be snowbirds, we like to go to places like Florida, right? <laughs> so, during the summer, they breed up in the Arctic, as I said. Um, I can only imagine when they come down here that they find something uh, familiar. They, they, go, they nest up in the Arctic wetlands, so coming down here in a place that looks like wetlands is probably very familiar to them. I chose long-tailed ducks because they dot the bays and the harbors here in the winter. You can see them from places like Silver Shell or uh, Planet Island, and they're, you can see them quite readily. They're not only an unusual looking duck, but they also have a unique yodeling call, which I really, really want to play for you. So, really, really unique call. Uh, it's the only bird, uh, duck that's going to kind of have something like that. And it's almost human like, actually. So, really fun looking, right? They're really easy to identify. Uh, not a whole lot of uh, confusion with other ducks. They got kind of this black and white kind of crazy design all over their bodies. And of course, the males, this, these are two males here, they have this long tail, uh, very descriptive in the name. The females are a little different, they're, a little, they're slightly smaller, and they actually look like female bubblehead. Um, uh, these birds are active divers, but unlike other, many other ducks, they don't use their feet to propel them in the water, uh, much like a, a loon would, uh, but they actually use, use to flap their wings in the water, which is just kind of strange to me. So for example, loons uh, have, have kind of adapted and their feet are actually at the back of their body, and which makes them really, really excellent swimmers. You can also think of like a penguin who's completely adapted into water and its feet are just made to be in the water. So loons are kind of really, really similar. But this bird, which again is also really, really known to be down in the water a lot, is not adapted to the same. Its, it's legs are right down the middle and it's able to kind of be on land just as well as it is in, in the water. American oyster catcher. One of the absolute wackiest looking birds <laughs> I have ever seen. It not only uh, doesn't just stop over here or flies over here, but it actually breeds here right in Marion. They arrive early too. You can already see oyster catchers from Silver Shell Beach here. Uh, they nest on islands, sandy or rocky, and they make their nest by merely putting a little scratch in the sand or the, or the rocks. So it's really basically nothing. And although their nesting strategy may not be as precarious as the salt marsh sparrow, it really doesn't seem that ideal. I, I know people that have come across nests and they've seen little uh, oyster catcher babies on basically a little spit of land where you think, is that still there after high tide, and yet they're able to make it and survive. This is a, a adult with a baby. Uh, much like human babies, they are very cute. <laughs> so the American oyster catcher is actually a success story. Uh, they were once in decline, but over the past 10 plus years, have been heavily monitored, and lots of time has gone into working uh, with the general public, especially in places in the mid-Atlantic, to make sure humans and oyster catchers can coexist on the beaches together. All the scientists' work has paid off as the birds have rebounded and populate, population growth has grown. Not only are they wacky looking, but during the spring have a boisterous call. 
Pairs often bonding for many consecutive years will be seen in unison giving up a piping call on the beach or in flight. And I have a video that I'm going to play because it's just very, very cool. It can actually help oyster catchers. Uh, many oyster catchers in the area will have bands on them. The bands are, are quite large for a band. They, they're usually here. They're colored. They're all kinds of different colors. They can be yellow, red, green, blue. Um, I think those signify where they, what country they were caught in, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but the, uh, what's called the American Oyster Catcher Working Group has been banding uh, birds since 1999, and they've banded over 6,000 birds. Um, so if you see a banded bird on the beach, you can actually just go to their website and log that you saw the bird. If you're actually able to um, ID, there's little letters and, and numbers on each one. If you're able to actually see that, it's really super helpful for them because they can actually get the exact bird. But even if you see the color, that's super helpful because they can use that information. Okay, our first bird that isn't tied to the ocean. But as we can see in its name, it's still tied to water. The northern water thrush. Uh, it's not to be confused with its uh, cousin, the Louisiana water thrush, which can also be seen here in Massachusetts. Uh, the water thrush is a warbler and it likes swamps, bogs, and thickets bordering wetlands. And if that isn't the rest of Marion, I don't know what is. <laughs> There's also uh, almost just one exclusive uh, place you can see the water thrush, and it's not Brewfish that's highlighted here. It's just down the street from Brewfish, which is at Sipican Lands Trust White Eagle property. I found the bird to arrive in early May, and uh, to hear. Uh, and to hear it, you may need to get there super early. I found really early. Uh, when most people are kind of taking to the trail in the morning for an early morning walk, uh, this bird is almost always stopped by them. So it, it's an early singer for whatever reason, and, um, and then it stops. So I do recommend getting to the trails early. Uh, the bird was often found deep in the swamp or thickets. It's hard to see. So the first thing we'll kind of want to do is, uh, what I do is I will actually have like a bird app on my phone and I will listen to the song, because it's kind of difficult to remember, and I'll play it and I'll kind of stick it in my head and then I'll listen for it. Um, that's a great way to kind of figure out where this bird might be and then you kind of have to be patient and see if it'll come out. This bird is doing very well, although destruction in uh, wetlands and climate change impacts on mangroves and forests and their wintering grounds is their biggest threat. And then migrate, migrate. Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, I don't remember where northern water thrushes migrate to. Um, so I'm not going to say off the top of my head because I don't know. And what is your app that you use for looking for the uh, I, I, um, The easiest app to use is just the Audubon app. It's a free app, so it's kind of the one I recommend because it's free. It's very simple to use. It's got a, a search function. You can just click it and type the bird in and it'll pop right up with any information you need and songs and calls and all that. Really, really uh, simple and free. So.
So this is the Windroll. It's a very large shorebird. And as you can see, it has a super, super long bill. I call it the gonzo of the shorebird. <laughs> <laughs> it also shouldn't be confused with a more common bird that we see here a lot, which is the willet. So this is a willet, and that's a wimble. And they're both large and brown. Um, as you can see, if you look really, really closely, their bills are quite different. The wimble bill uh, has, goes down a lot. So now that we have that sorted out, we can kind of, you know, what, what makes this bird special? So let's take a quick look at this migration map, which uh, from research done at the organization I work for, Manamet. So uh, a couple colleagues of mine uh, worked on helping and discovering like how windrows migrate, and this particular map is about two uh, two windrows they caught on Cape Cod and they put satellite trackers on their back, super light, they're super thin and have no effect to the bird. And so they caught them here in the Cape Cod, uh, down in uh, Belfleet. And these two birds then flew down to South America. This is where they're gonna winter. So these two particular birds up here and down here. Um, and then both birds during spring migration, let's say May, or probably April when they got to Texas, they flew up to Texas here. Uh, this is pretty common. A lot of species will uh, migrate right through the middle of the state that are coming right up here. And then they found that they bred right here. After they were done breeding, uh, at least one of them made a stop over site here, just a little, and then down into Canada, or, or excuse me, from Canada down to here in Cape Cod, they made kind of a big uh, stop over site. Uh, my colleagues have found birds uh, uh, basically roosting and refueling their bodies, right? So this is a super long flight. Some birds can actually do this nonstop, uh, but the windmill makes a stop over around us, thankfully. You know, it makes us, we are able to see it. And then it takes off from Cape Cod. And we're lucky enough to actually see this bird. Uh, some, they don't all go to Cape Cod, so we can see this bird like in late August at Silver Shell Beach. And then uh, many of them actually make a, a 2,500 uh, mile journey down to South America. Pretty cool. The, this is how the one of the nests up in, uh, up in uh, the Arctic in Canada. It's amazing to me, uh, we talk about safe places, it's apparently found it so safe that it's just nesting right there on the ground, uh, which is really, really cool. And obviously, it, it blends in really well. So uh, this is a, a map of kind of where sightings have been for uh, Wimbrels. Uh, Silver Shell Beach is probably the main place that you would see them, um, but apparently someone also has seen one down on the Coop Cove down in Converse. Uh, again, this is just a mineral, uh, a Marian general kind of clip. Alright, so the American woodcock. It's a plump bird with a large head and a short neck and a short tail. Kind of looks like a really small football. Uh, and it's a hard to tell from this photo because it's I chose a photo that makes it look really camouflaged. I did that on purpose. But it's got a, a bill that's basically taking over its body. It's really, really large. Uh, this bird also looks like a, a snipe. So if you've seen snipe in fields, in other words, they're much more common. They're out there doing the thing. Um, this bird is similar, but they kind of... Anyway, they're both little short birds that are not necessarily at the beach, right? And so... Like I just said, they're not shore birds that you're going to find at the beach like other ones. And it's pretty obvious why. Their color, they decided to be brown and buffy and black and gray, which more resembles a forest floor, right? And that's where you're going to find these birds. They're super secretive. You're not going to find them most of the time. They don't really come out and hang out, except during spring. So starting around mid-March, they have a courtship display. And 
is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Let me make sure I get the right one.
which of course means birders love town ducks. <laughs> and it's not just gulls that hang around. Uh, sometimes you can see you know, hundreds of gulls flying around dumps. It's not just gulls. In fact, according to uh, an eBird listing for the water treatment plant, there's, there's been 125 different species seen there. Um, and it's not just ducks or gulls. Uh, also, shorebirds go there uh, during migration. They actually, during particularly wet times, they'll use the mud and look for, look for food there. And of course, um, not all uh, water treatment plants and dumps have, you know, are surrounded by trees, but we're lucky enough to have trees around us, which means there are birds. So it's a great place to see things like all year round, like northern cardinals or a northern perula. Mm -hmm. So this is the second warbler species I'm talking about. I couldn't really talk about unique birds of Marion without talking about like one super bright warbler because to me they are just one of the highlight birds um, of, the, of the year. And they're only really here in, in the month of May. Uh, so this bird you can find uh, you're going to want to look for deciduous trees, and probably after a good a night of south winds, you're going to want to go to these trees and you'll be able to find this beautiful bird. It's got this blue-gray back, and then it's got this green-yellowish spot up here. Hard to see a lot of the times, but if it angles just right, it pops just like in this photo. And of course, it's got this bright yellow throat, which amazes uh, with beauty. Uh, I'm highlighting this particular warbler instead of others that we have here, um, because one, you, you may have never actually heard of this bird before. And also, it's easy to track down during spring migration, because it's so common, even here in the south coast of Maryland. You can find it quickly fluttering around trees and making its quick buzzy song. And for many warblers, that can be confusing because many of them look the same. They're all kind of yellowish and they do the same thing and they're kind of high in trees. This is uh, one of only two uh, warbler species that are mostly blue. So uh, it can be easy to pick out from others. Uh, interesting fact, back in the day, John James Audubon and Alexander Wilson, both uh, ornithologists, used to call this bird the blue-yellow-backed warbler which I suppose is a descriptive of the bird, but it's a little mouthful to say. So number 10, the chimney swift. So I'm going to end the presentation with the humble chimney swift, or the flying cigar, as many of us birders call it. <laughs> See kind of a cigar shape there with wings, which is able to ID it from like a tree swallow or a barn swallow very quickly. This bird always reminds me of summer more than any other bird. It arrives here in Marion in May, making its way up from South America. Uh, I like them in the summer because unlike many other birds that are super loud and active in the spring, like a robin or a warbler, uh, those birds tend to quiet down as the spring goes on and the summer hits, and you don't necessarily hear from them as much anymore, right? But the chimney swift comes to, they're flying, they're all summer long, they're kind of flying in little groups along, uh, around town, and uh, they don't really go away, they're just kind of there, which is kind of cool. Uh, because of their adaptation to the chimney, hence their name, from, from used to be caves and hollow trees, the best place to actually see them is right here in the village uh, because they rely on chimneys. And this is the place where there are mostly chimneys in Marion. Um, in fact, I've seen them go in the building right across the street here. <laughs> uh, so if you're, if you're watching them in the sky, you can actually find their home quite quickly because often they'll just all of a sudden drop right down right into their home. It's kind of cool. I, I, it's really difficult to find bird nests, but chimney swifts kind of have a, a, a dead giveaway for them. So I want to give a little, uh, Dave Sidley describes them going to chimneys like this. So 
So when it's time for squirts to go to roost inside a chimney, they approach at high speed, stall directly over the opening, and awkwardly flutter straight down into the chimney. And I, I think that perfectly describes this bird. They are super, uh, they just like have, like, their speed is like 0 to 60, they're going 60 the whole time, and then the whole time they're eating insects in the group, and then they're like, oh yeah, I need to go to the chimney for a second. Stop them. It's just really weird. Is that where their nest is? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So almost uh, exclusively they nest in chimneys nowadays. Uh, like I said, they used to nest like in caves or uh, or tree cabins, but not but not so much anymore. Um, and uh, they, they nest in chimneys because of their adaptation. Um, basically, their <coughs> legs and talons have adapted so much that they can actually, they literally cannot perch on a tree. And so they can only kind of cling to a wall. That's like a chimney. Um, there's actually been a sharp decline in chimney swifts over the past, uh, over the many years. And that's really due to people capping their chimneys or building new houses with chimneys that um, aren't, aren't made for chimney swifts to live in, right? They have like little, uh, little pipes coming up instead of like a, a traditional bigger, bigger chimney. Um, but even with uh, fewer chimneys around, I still have people coming up to me saying, you know, I have these chimney swifts in my chimney this spring, and they're just really, really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and I just feel really bad for the swifts because I'm like, this is maybe your only, <laughs> only place to live around here. And, and you have the person that owns this place that doesn't even want here. <laughs> but that makes me think about, you know, maybe, you know, when, when chimneys were super common around here, did, did, people, did people just have like a symbiotic relationship and they just kind of, you know, liked, not necessarily liked having their own, but they just, it was part of, living, right? They had swifts in their house and it was fine and they, they were in there for a month or two and they, they left. Or was it, you know, like most of us nowadays were like, oh, they're just so annoying, I don't want them in my house, but there's nothing I can do because I need this chimney to keep my house warm. <laughs> um, so I was, I'm always curious about if, if there's like history books describing relationships with uh, swifts. Um, Interesting enough, there are, uh, I described other, like the oyster catcher, there are ways you can kind of uh, be a citizen scientist and kind of uh, help track them. There are movements, uh, because chimneys are becoming less and less, there are movements to actually build these structures. They're like uh, faux chimneys. They're, I'm not quite sure how tall they are, but they're probably here to the ceiling. They're probably that tall. They look like, they literally look just like a chimney. And they build them at, you know, like in fields and stuff and they provide uh, uh, houses uh, for Swifts. Um, so people are just starting to kind of do that in their, their space, uh, knowing that the species is in, uh, in, in decline. Can I ask you a question? Um, New Bedford has a lot of big old chimneys. Mm -hmm. Has anyone done any surveys of chimney Swifts because of those big old chimneys? They'd be perfect for this. Uh, yeah, my guess is they're probably capped, so they would have to uncap them, which would probably make people have to manage them. Mm -hmm. um, I think because they're just kind of a nuisance, people are kind of unwilling to do that. Um, but it's a, it's a good idea. I mean, it's probably where the most prevalent right now is in places like New Bedford. Um, they're big, they're not small. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, what I've heard from other people about chimney swifts. So what they do at the end of summer is they actually kind of, like many other bird species, they start to gather up in large groups. And uh, I've had people describe um, seeing hundreds of chimney swifts kind of go around in these bigger chimneys, right? Not just like a home chimney, but like for a factory. And uh, they kind of roost there during fall migration. They'll roost there so you can see all these you know, hundreds, um, possibly thousands of chimney swifts kind of going around the chimney, roosting there for the night, and then, you know, at some point in the morning, popping out, which is pretty cool. Do they, are they night hunters or evening hunters? Or? Uh, they're day hunters, so um, I kind of describe them like, um, 
like kids during the summer like on bicycles, they're just kind of always riding around in the summer, right? So chimney swifts, I feel like are the same, like they gave me the same exact feeling of seeing kids in the summer. They're just in the summer, they're in the groups, I, I see them all over the village here, and they're just, you know, three, four, sometimes six of them just flying around all day. Um, they're pretty cool. Like I said, they go, they start gathering for uh, fall migration, and then they head back to South America. So these are the 10 species um, that we talked about today. Does anybody have any questions or questions as we go along? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I saw some uh, uh, birds in my neighborhood, even during the winter time. Those birds must not be migrating, right? They just stay there forever, right? Yeah, so, uh, good question. You didn't so, mention anyone in your pictures. Uh, no, I talked concept. a lot about a lot of um, a migratory birds, and I did that because most of us do know about like things like cardinals and robins and yeah. goldfinches and right. other types of birds that are here literally every day of the year. Uh -huh. um, and so a lot of birds do hang around here in winter. They're able to survive uh -huh. mostly on seed. So these are birds that eat seed. Uh, things like robins eat fruit from trees, yeah. super important for their survival or food. Um, and those birds stay here all winter long. They've been able to adapt to our conditions and, and live here. Chickadees, of course, nuthatches; hatches, those things really rely on seed. And you can see them stashing during the late fall and even during the year. You know, I also saw food. some kind of bird. The, the color in the, all the feather is the red mm -hmm. and it's copper. They always fly by couple, and my neighbor always use the, you know, bird feed. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the name of it. I just saw it every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And northern cardinals are, are a red species. Yeah. Um, they are often seen even in pairs in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. Although you almost always see them in pairs during the spring as right. they're uh, as they're breeding, and um, yeah, really cool bird because uh, when it snows here. The color kind of even flashes even more. Yes. Yeah. Should we be feeding the birds? I just read an article again about a disease that you know maybe is coming up from the south. Is it due to uh, avian flu? Uh, I don't know if they named it. Um, was it an avian flu? Is it an eye infection? I, yes. I, think it's, I, I think right now it's, it's still okay. I, I know last year there was a question about feeding birds, so yeah. many of us were not feeding birds in the summer, which I usually don't have a hard time with anyways, because birds at my area don't generally go for the seed in the summer. But um, uh, it ended up not being a, a problem too much up here in New England. It was more of a mid-Atlantic problem last year. Okay. Um, I'm not going to throw out any theories, but I've heard uh, probably pretty comprehensive and crazy theories about why, but it really didn't make it up here last year. Um, and at this point, we can still feed birds. Um, I think either way, birds uh, either, you know, there are, there are really, really good things about feeding birds, especially during like a winter storm. You know, it can really make a difference uh, to birds surviving. But otherwise, you know, if, if you, whether you feed birds or don't feed birds, uh, they're gonna find food. Um, for many, for many of them, it's a secondary resource. Oh. Yeah. Uh, this is probably very weird, but what if you found a bird that looked alive and it, it was on the ground or something? It looked injured. What would you do? With what it? would you do? Uh, so that's uh, quite common. Um, so many birds um, will hit windows um, either accidentally or sometimes on purpose. Um, sometimes birds uh, will do that on purpose because they'll see their reflection in the glass, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, cardinals do this a lot, and, they hit, and the bird, you know, defensive of the territory, and so they whack themselves. Sometimes they'll um, knock themselves out. A lot of birds will will get right up and be okay. Um, some birds will take a little bit. Um, I would recommend not messing with the bird. Um, I, I do recommend uh, if there are cats in the neighborhood to make sure aren't, the cats aren't getting near the birds during that time because that's, 
you know, it's an injured bird at the moment, um, and it would be very easy to capture it. And, um, but most likely the bird's going to be okay and do its thing soon enough. If you notice it there all day, you can call um, a wildlife um, kind of re rehabilitation place. I know there's, we don't have any really close to here. There's one on the Cape, and then there's one up somewhere on the South Shore. So those are really the only the two places. Um, but you could always call them and say, I've seen this bird here now for you know, six hours. Yeah. It's not doing anything. You know, what should I do? Yeah? I have a friend's house, red-tailed hawk, black-tailed hawk, and they have their own house. Oh, gosh. They have screen on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it died. Wow. Yeah, we don't know why. Mm -hmm. Wow, I've never heard of, I guess I've never seen a hawk fly into a window before. She That's... wasn't home, but when she came home, the hawk was... Yeah, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. And she, that, it wasn't this big expanse of windows, they're all small, narrow windows yeah. that all had screens on, so they didn't, they didn't see its image. Yeah. And we just can't figure out what's happening. Yeah, I, I have no idea. I, wow, that's, I mean, it must have been, it was probably chasing something and uh, I probably didn't realize that there was a window there, is my guess. It's probably looked just like enough, enough like a window that it would be hit it. When I was a kid, there was one that flew into a, um, I lived on Delano Road, and it flew into my neighbor's picture window, and behind the picture room, picture window was a child in um, a pregnant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he flew away, and it seems okay. Interesting, yeah. yeah. They all will find big windows yeah. that have no, that they think they see the reflection. Yeah. yeah, yeah, or they can't see it in, they just think they're going through it. Yeah. yeah. Back. Well, it's a comment. Um, I will remember the northern perula because it is the colors of the Ukrainian flag. Oh, mm. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh my goodness, I love that. <clears throat> Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what about the bird feeders? Do you winter all year round? I've heard you should, you shouldn't. What? It's really up to you. Um, I. Generally, we'll have my bird feeder out all year round, um, but I also notice in the summer that I don't really have birds come to my feeders as much, and I have more squirrels than birds. <laughs> so I will actually tend to take them down in the summertime. Um, I do like having them up from like late fall through through uh, you know May at least. Um, it's really just up to you. It's you know it's kind of a human interaction. Like I said, um, you know, the birds generally are not depending on you to, to keep them alive. Um, it's more of a, a relationship between you and the birds and being able to see them up close. Um, you know, so it's just really an enjoyable thing for you, hopefully. Um, I love seeing winter birds being able to, you know, most of those birds are looking for seed. Um, so you're going to see more birds in the winter where we have a lot more migratory birds coming up, and of course, even robins now, you know, they go from fruit and maybe, you know, maybe you'll see them pecking for seed in the wintertime if they're really desperate. But of course, now they want straight for, wor for worms, you know, good protein foods. So that's why many birds like insects because it's great protein, right? Um, they're hunting all day. It's nice for us too because they eat mosquitoes and bugs that irritate us, but are really, really good for them. Yeah? Yeah, generally, uh, I think bur uh, bread is, is not considered good for birds. Yeah, especially <laughs> uh, Yeah, I, um, yeah. If you're gonna leave, uh, just just like your like, if you have bird feeders at home and you have seed out, um, that's generally if, if you're gonna be somewhere that's public, I would recommend putting seed down and not and not bread. Yeah. yeah. On the on the uh, bread issue, it's not a good idea to use that. To birds because they uh, get what they call angel wings and they cannot fly. It affects the wing development in the, in the bone. Oh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it can, it can do really harm in their, in their stomach too. Yeah. Yeah. Have hummingbirds been sighted 
on this area yet? Um, I guess my answer would be maybe. Uh, I generally don't look for hummingbirds quite yet. Um, and I say maybe because uh, Cape Cod is a really good place for uh, variants and migrants. Mm -hmm. So they will either tend to uh, leave their last or come there first, or kind of skip over, kind of like Marion, and hit there. It probably has something to do with the way it sticks out in the water and the way the birds migrate up. Um, so there might be some seen there. My guess is we have not seen them here yet. Um, most people see them starting, some people see them early April. Um, I don't really start seeing them until mid-April. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it really depends on a lot of those. Like many other species of birds, they, they go to the same place every year. And so for some people that um, put out like a hummingbird feeder, you know, April 1st every year, you know, they might get uh, one or two early hummingbirds where the rest of us may not. Yeah? Does, does the bird club that you belong to have a website? Or? Uh, it does. It's uh, NBCBirdClub.com, or you can just search for Nascatucket on Google. Nascatucket? Uh, Nascatucket Bird Club, yes. yeah. Nascatucket is a uh, a little river over in Fairhaven. So, NBC Bird? Uh, bird Club. 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 Okay. Yeah. Just one last question. Like, even though we've been talking a lot about Marion, like, birds don't know they're going in for another <laughs> <laughs> So, are we talking about the general, you know, where him, uh, now, what is it, Rochester? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, all those, all these ten birds uh, do like this, uh, this general area. Yeah, most of it applies. Uh, one exception is Rosie Turn. As I mentioned, uh, Bird Island is the second most important um, nesting site for them. Uh, is that Bird Island know. that you had on the screen? Yes. Yeah, so this is an uh, aerial view of Bird Island. Um, in, uh, I know they recently did some construction to build it up to uh, expand it and help protect it from sea level rise. Yeah. <laughs> there is a large population of terns that hangs out at Ram Island, which is off the coast of that, right off the point of yep. that coast. Do you know if any of the roseates uh, live there as well? Or is it yeah, so, so Ram Island is, you know, I don't know if it's the second most important place in Buzzard Bay, but I think it is. Uh -huh. So those two, those two places are, one, two, either way, are just far away, like, super important. Um, and a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the populations of roseate terns over the years have kind of moved to those two islands um, from kind of gall infestations, other places like on the Cape, and they've kind of moved there. Um, yeah, so both those islands, super important. But elsewhere, I mean, you can see them um, on Pettakees Island, they nest there, they nest in, you know, they do nest other places, but like I said, 25% of the population is on, you know, Bird Island alone, which is just crazy to think about. And another huge percentage is on, on Ram, Ram Island. Yeah.